um, I was invited uh, to come and talk to you about defining moments, uh, both from a business perspective and a culture perspective. Uh, and this journey for me has been about a 40-year journey. So when you think back and you try and collect your thoughts to, to share with you all, because my goal uh, today is to, to try and share with you the lessons that I've learned, both in business development and culture development in Harmony, uh, to, to help you leave the, the Olin School and go out and make the world a better place and, and to live a life uh, of purpose and fulfillment as you uh, deploy the skills that you have learned here at Olin. So that is our goal, to share with you some lessons. And I had to boil them down because 40 years has got a lot of lessons. And when you make all the mistakes I did, you have even more lessons that you've learned. So we call it truly human leadership. And uh, my hope is by the end of this time we have together that you'll understand what we mean by human leadership. And uh, uh, I'm going to refer to the word management that occasionally I hear in graduate business schools. But in Barry Waymiller, uh, we're not allowed to use the word management. And we'll get into that. And so my goal again today is, is to try and give you some defining moments that will help shape your career from the experiences of my career. As the assignment was, how are we going to put the soul into leadership? I started to say, uh, put the soul back into leadership, but I'm not sure the soul ever was in leadership. Uh, and so our goal today is living a life of meaning and purpose and, and letting your leadership model reflect uh, uh, your soul and, and to, to live a life of, in harmony. So I got a degree from uh, Indiana, undergraduate degree in Indiana in accounting uh, and a graduate degree from Michigan, an MBA from Michigan. And I was taught about creating shareholder value. It was a great word. Uh, it's what I think uh, we are, our educational system and business school tries to do uh, is to create shareholder value. I took management classes. Uh, I got a management degree. And therefore, I assumed when I graduated that I was uh, uh, supposed to manage. Try and think of anybody in your life that you can manage. Anybody. The young couple that are getting married. Uh, <laughs> nobody can be managed. Nobody wants to be managed. But we'd have you take management classes give you management degrees, and give you management titles, and therefore you think you're supposed to manage. You think because you have this degree and that you get promoted in, in the business you're in, that you're, you did it because you're smart and you know the answers. And what we're going to do today is reverse that in terms of what leadership is. Again, I had an accounting degree. I got a CPA when I graduated, and I worked, went to work for Price Waterhouse. We talked about profits. We talked about shareholder value. And we talked about personal success. Uh, I don't ever remember anybody talking about the responsibility of leadership. First of all, they didn't use the word leadership. They used management, which I suspect you have had plenty of. And so what we're going to share with you in this journey is what we learned about in creating value for all stakeholders, all the people involved in the journey with you to create value. How do you create value for all those people? And the other thing that uh, I want to come away from this for you to understand, you're about to enter, most of you, the business world. And you're going to have an opportunity to, to continue to develop share, and be appreciated for your gifts. Business organizations are the single most powerful force that could change this world to the world that you want to be a part of. Because when you think about the time people spend in the organ, you spend and people who will work with you spend in organizations, and the impact that makes on their feeling of who they are, it is a profound opportunity for us to shape the world that you want to live in. We look at churches, we look at nonprofits, we look at community organizations that try to deal with the issues we face. But if business would accept the profound opportunity they have to shape those lives of people who join their organizations, if we defined leadership as the opportunity to shape lives in a common economic vision, it would make a profound difference in the world we live in. We wouldn't need the government to solve our problems, we wouldn't need the nonprofits if, in fact, business accepted 
that they are the single source that could make this country the place we want it to be. So, when I took over the company at my dad's death in 1975, we had a $20 million business that was fragile, and we have built it into today about a $1.5 billion global organization with five platforms for growth. And my mentor was Chuck Knight. So I studied Chuck, and Chuck grew businesses through acquisitions. And, and so I would say to you that uh, it is, is humbling to me to be in the Knight Center and share with you our leadership model because I've had the opportunity to have Chuck come over and share with him the impact his leadership made on our business. Um, at the end of the session we had with Chuck, which was about a three-hour session, he said the most inspiring thing to me he could ever say. He said, Bob, you're doing everything right. And from Chuck Knight, that is a blessing, okay? So we uh, uh, grew through acquisitions, and the company is a healthy, vibrant, uh, uh, $1.5 billion company with operations you can see all over the world. We began doing acquisitions because the company was in a very old industry making bottle washers, returnable bottle washers and pasteurizers for the brewing industry. And it was my determination in the 1980s that that market had no future. That if we didn't do something to change the dynamics, if looking forward we couldn't see better markets with a better opportunity, that we had no future. So the only thing I knew was what Chuck, Chuck Knight had done in mature industries, which was acquire and bring together companies. So I set about trying to acquire companies to give us a future with no money and no credibility and no experience. And I began buying small companies that I, and it's, a, it's, it's another whole class to see how you buy companies with no money and no experience. Uh, but we did. Uh, and we were able to grow this company through over 50 acquisitions since 1987. So uh, again, you can see the growth is really not, we're not in growth markets. We're in mature markets like Emerson was, but our growth was a series of 52 acquisitions. Uh, one of the words that I want you to take away today is the word balance. In 19, probably 82, 1981, a banker was walking through my plant. And we had a tremendous amount of business with Anheuser-Busch. Uh, and I was walking the banker through the plant and commenting on Jacksonville Project, Los Angeles Project, Merrimack Project. And he said, don't you ever worry about the concentration you have with Anheuser-Busch? And I said, not really. I said, uh, we've been doing business with Anheuser-Busch since 1901. It was our first customer. And every year we project their demand. They buy more than we anticipated. So why would I worry about that? Well, uh, that's where the word balance came from. Because a senior vice president of engineering in about 1982, 83, retired. And the new vice president of engineering decided that maybe dealing with our company they ought to take a fresh look. And they completely changed sources of supply. It, that was almost the death blow for us. I said that day, I will never ever build a business model that is dependent on any one market, any one technology, any one customer. So that if, you, know, you look at NCR Corporation who built cash registers. You look at Kodak that made film. You look at the companies that disappear in unbelievably short periods of time and they were never able to get balance. You look at Anheuser-Busch, who did extremely well in the brewing industry, but ended up losing, a, a, they did phenomenally well, but ended up losing the fight because they couldn't expand out of the brewing industry. So Barry Wimler today, the, the purpose of this chart, we got these charts in the 1970s from, Anna, uh, from Emerson Electric. We constantly mo monitor our business by, by market. We constantly are looking for new markets, new fundamentals, new technology, that keeps us balanced so that we do not, any one customer could change, the vice president of engineering retire, somebody else could change, and we would be fine. So that is the important word in your business model design is the word balance. This is, uh, this is the culmination of my credibility. Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett is the gold standard of, of business. And uh, about nine months ago, I said to our finance team, I'm curious, I, I really did not know. I said, I wonder how Berkshire Hathaway stock has done compared to Barry Wimler's stock. 
Now, I'm going to keep this really simple. Barry Weimler has a kind of a public stock. We use EVA stock. It, as Stern Stewart did a study some years ago of what drives public company values, and, and he did the Stern Stewart model. We embraced that some years ago. So we have uh, transactions in our stock frequently. Every six months, we have buys and sells, and it's based on an EVA value. I'll, I'll leave it at that. So we do have a market value. Uh, and so we went back to 1988 when we embraced this, and we charted Berkshire Hathaway's stock compared to Barry Wimler's stock. Uh, and as you can see from this chart, in that period of time, including the economic downturn of 2008-2009, Berkshire Hathaway stock has a compound growth of 4.6%. Barry Weimler's growth since 1988 is 15.96%. So the point of that is that we have created something here that creates value in the traditional way that you all are focusing on your, in your education. So what we're going to talk about now, which is the softer side of business and some of the values, doesn't mean that we're a nonprofit organization. Barry Weimler has created exceptional value. We have over 400 shareholders, and we have, uh, as a, one of our largest shareholders, about 7%, one of the large, wealthiest families in America. So we've earned the credibility of our share price and our performance model. So what we did is we transformed a 100-year-old company through acquisitions into a financially strong, value-creating organization for all stakeholders. All stakeholders are our team members, our communities, uh, uh, our suppliers, our bankers. We focus on everybody we touch. And uh, in, at the same time, uh, I would say to you that when we talk about the culture today, people want to assume that our culture is the reason we have done that, that financial track record I shared with you. The financial track record you see is more a reflection of our business model design. Our future is going to be shaped by our culture. In 1975, my dad died. The company was very fragile financially because the bank pulled on us, i.e. the bank pulled on us. But I brought my MBA skills and my intensity in response to my dad's death, and the company started growing dramatically. It was the talk of St. Louis. We grew from 18 to 72 million in four years. We did solar energy projects for Anheuser-Busch on the roof of their brewery in Jacksonville, Florida. We went from the most antiquated technology of pasteurizers, big tanks that pasteurize beer, to solar energy panels uh, with Lola Redford, Robert Redford's wife, and August Bush uh, about the future of solar energy. We created electronic inspection systems for the Carlsberg Brewery in Denmark. Uh, and we brought in a filler from Italy that began filling Coke and Anheuser-Busch products around uh, the United States. So we're having some profound success. 1982, everything I touched that I thought was gold started looking a different color. Everything simultaneously imploded. The solar energy panels started to crack. The electronic system in Carlsberg didn't quite get every defect in the containers they were inspecting, so they couldn't replace human. And the fillers started to foam when it filled Coca-Cola, so it wasn't filling properly. And as a result of that, because of the debt that we'd taken, I learned my first lesson. And my first lesson is financial disciplines. I always, I, I had lived so long in a company that never grew, was never exciting, it just existed, a 100-year-old company, that when we started growing from 18 to 17 million, I, I was recruiting people all over the world to work for our company. And, uh, but I didn't embrace the financial disciplines that I had learned. As a result of that, in 1983, our banks pulled on us. And I want, this is, I want to say this to you. We had an incredibly good relation. We were the largest, one of the largest borrowers of one of the largest banks in St. Louis. How do I know that? Because I got to sit on the front row behind the Cardinal dugout at every game, OK? <laughs> That's where the top customers of this bank sit. And the bank told me that we were one of the most valued customer that they thought the world of us and the way we kept them informed. At the end of the audit of 1983, that Italian Lyric, because we were bringing these fillers in from Italy, devalued. 
and the inventory we had had an issue. There were warranty issues with those fillers, with the solar panel, and they all came together. So I walked down to the bank. I hope you never have to do this. I walked down to the bank and said, I want you to know that we have, with Arthur Anderson, our accountant at the time, we have surfaced some issues. It looks like on about 72 million, we're going to report a loss of three to three and a half million. The senior credit officer, not the loan officer, the senior credit officer of the bank said these words to me. Bob, we understand you've kept us well informed. Just be sure you document what happened so we can understand it. So I went away feeling good. About a day or two later, our chief financial officer came to me and said, well, we found some more issues. The three and a half million looks like it's going to be five million. Again, these are non-cash issues. So it wasn't affecting our debt level, which was at about 22 million when interest rates were 22%. And I, went, went, uh, I walked down to the bank again. I said, I need to get back to you because I had said the other day it's going to be about three and a half million. It looks going to be five million. This is what you never want to hear from your banker. Let me get back to you, he said. I, he got back to me and said, Bob, we're going to pull the loan. Now, I don't ever want you to know what it feels like to walk home at night not knowing if you're going to be able to make cover the payroll checks that week for everybody who's trusted you. That is a, if you say to a woman that's having a baby, I can imagine how that feels. That is a ludicrous statement, okay? <laughs> if you say to somebody who just had their loan pulled on them and they don't know how they're going to pay the obligations they have, you can't imagine what that feels like. In the community you live where you had been this star, it was a humbling experience. And so I learned the hard way. We went nine months from 1983 to early 1984 without a line of credit. We lived day to day with cash. One day I had a management meeting at 7 o'clock in the morning. I brought our people over from England who are English operation. We sat there at 9 o'clock in the morning. And I said, okay, guys, we need to talk because obviously everybody was worried. And uh, I said, why don't we go get a cup of coffee? And um, my controller, who was not very uh, sensitive to things, which is somewhat uh, appropriate for an accounting position, um, <laughs> My, my controller uh, said to me, Bob, we got a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, well, they repossessed our coffee maker last week because we haven't paid the coffee company in nine months. We learned for uh, a matter of nine months what it feels like to live with no cash. I will tell you that the, the reason we are where we are today is because of those nine months. Because that is when we saw the true value of things that was masked when cash was easy. So financial disciplines and profound respect for cash. And the other thing I'll say to you is never tell me, if I'm your advisor, that I've got a good relationship with my banker. When you move out of the risk profile of your banker, it doesn't matter if you're his brother-in-law, his favorite brother-in-law. It's over. OK? It's over because there's a certain risk tolerance the bank can have. So never depend, never depend on relationships in banking. Depend upon financial integrity and disciplines. That is the only foundation upon which you can build a company. Other than financial disciplines, balance is one of the most important words. Balance in your personal life, balance in your professional life, balance in your business. Never be too dependent on any one market. That is a piece of advice I give people all the time. And if you are dependent, work with a strategy to reduce your dependency because you have that risk at all times of losing that balance. Uh, the other thing we did uh, that is unique that I would encourage you to do is we had an outside legal board. When my dad died, I voted 97% of the stock of the company. And August Bush happened to introduce me to a gentleman during the rapid rise of our company. August Bush introduced me to a guy who was chairman of Owens, Illinois. And I was in awe of him because everything we did was in glass containers, and they were the largest glass company in the world. I decided that here I am 30, in my very early 30s. I have this now responsibility for this business. And this was, again, the growth period. And that everybody needs a good boss. Do you know how many companies I see, they put family mothers, their brother-in-law, their wife, their kids on the board? Uh, it's amazing to me. Uh, we, I ended up recruiting Bob Lanigan, 
uh, August Bush encouraged him and he took the position. Bob later became uh, chairman of Owens, Illinois. He was on the Chrysler Daimler board. Uh, he's been on many public company boards. August Bush described him as the best businessman in America. And the guidance that I have gotten, and when I say guidance, when you have a professional board, every board meeting of ours is a disciplined dialogue with our directors. And in 32, 35 years, nobody has ever rejected a proposal I've made at the board. Not because I vote 97% of stock, because I would never put something before our board that they would reject. So it's been a tremendous stimulus to our team, to me, because every board meeting is like a show. We want to show them we are competent, thorough, professional, and make them proud to be on our board. So we have a very professional outside board, even though my family still votes about 67% uh, of the uh, company. And then acquisitions. I always say the best way to play the game, the best way to play the game in business is a combination of organic growth and acquisition growth. It's, it's like the best offense and defense. You've got to play both to, to play the game at the highest level. And yet, I came down here and talked to WashU one time, and, and I did a study before I talked, 77% of all acquisitions fail. It's a high risk, but it's why you're sitting here, because Chuck Knight was very good at acquisitions. It's why I'm standing here, because I embraced many of Chuck's ideas and developed an acquisition strategy. So again, we've done over 70 acquisitions, but we've done 50-some uh, since 1987. Uh, now. I mentioned here a London IPO. In 1983, remember the bank pulled on us. Our sales dropped from 72 million to 55 million. We ended up getting refinanced after nine months with one of those guys you meet in an alley and he gives you an envelope, okay? It's called asset-based lending. And when I went to Chicago to sign these loan documents with Citicorp, which was the lender, there was a table from here to that camera, and I just went around and signed my name about 350 times. If I hiccuped, hiccuped, they owned the business in asset-based lending. So I got a loan, barely, and we had a chance for a new beginning, and we began doing acquisition. I sat down with my finance team in about 1984, uh, and I said, guys, we're going to have to start looking at acquisition because there's no future in our business. And we've got to start doing acquisition. My finance team looked at me and said, great idea, Bob. We've only got one problem. We have absolutely no money. And I said to them these same words, don't tell me what we can't do. I didn't tell you I needed uh, money. I said, we've got to do acquisitions to create a future. So we began doing acquisitions. We issued stock in our company. Uh, uh, we, we, got, we went into overfunding in our asset-based loan. And, and fortunately, we began hitting it out of the ballpark with acquisitions. What do you buy when you have no money, no credibility, and no experience? Crap. <laughs> Seriously. We bought what nobody else wanted. And the point here is within three years, an idea surface to take the acquisitions we've done plus a piece of the historic business and go public on the London Stock Exchange. Now that seems crazy, but we hit it so far out of the ballpark with these little acquisitions that we had this $37 million company that looked pretty good when you carved out our historic business that was sick. And the idea surfaced that we could take it public on the London Stock Exchange, which we did, and it looked like a million to one that we'd take this company public. And again, you understand what we bought with no money, no credibility, no experience. And yet the public in London sent in $1.1 billion trying to buy the $28 million of stock we were selling. We thought when we began the process, we'd be able to pay off our debt and end up with $2 million in the bank. At the end of the day, we ended up with $28 million in the bank and a $17 million liquid investment in a public company, 30% of the remaining public company. That was 1988. Our directors were so astounded at the transformation of the company through that event that Harvard came down and the Darden School came down and did a case study of that transformation of a company. So in 1988, with $28 million in the bank and a broken $21 year old, uh, $20 million company, Warren Shapley came to me, one of our esteemed directors. Uh, you see his name all over St. Louis. He was President Ross Prina just prior to that. 
He came to me and said, Bob, you're going to take that $28 million and you're going to pour it down the drain of that historic business. And I said, no, I'm not. And we fixed our historic business and we sat down at the same time and we said, what did we learn? We had tremendous growth, traumatic decline, unbelievable recovery. We must have learned something. So we sat down for nine months and thought about what we'd learned. And we said, from what we've learned, how would we design the ideal business model? So we began designing a business model that we were going to implement now. And this time, we had cash, experience, and credibility. This is the most important thing you're going to learn in your entire business education. If you just, the reason I'm standing here today is this. There is no relationship between cost and market value. I was educated in finance. I thought there was. And one day, it occurred to me there wasn't. And I'm going to give you the story, a very brief story. We bought our first acquisition. We bet everything on it. If we had failed, we failed. And I went to the company I bought. I bought a $3 million company, $3.5 million company in Boulder, Colorado that's losing money. And I said to the vice president of sales, tell me about your product. And he said, well, we make these electronic inspectors for the glass industry. And domestic, we don't really have any competition. And we sell it for uh, $57,000. Cost is about $26,000. Internationally, we sell it for about $63,000. But we do have a lot of competition in Europe because the French make a competitive product. I said, well, wait, I must have missed something. You said you sell it for $57,000 domestically. And, and you don't have any competition. And you sell it for 63000 internationally and have a lot of competition. He said, yeah, because it costs us more money to do business internationally. I said to the gentleman, would you do me a favor? Would you raise the domestic price to the foreign price? Uh, I'm going to close on this transaction in the next three weeks. I'm going to have to live with the quotes. So I just assumed, could you do that? And he said, sure. So they raised the domestic price to 63000 He said, hey, Bob, the other good thing is we're about to get a large order from a Foster Forbes Glass Company, and it's going to be a great order, and you, you'll be the beneficiary of it. And I said, oh, I said, that's not good news, because the seller may decide that his business is worth more and blow the deal. Uh, can I fly to that company and talk to him? He said, sure. So I flew. It's actually down uh, in southern uh, Missouri, Foster Forbes Glass Company. I flew down. I met with the president. Uh, and I sat down with the president. I said, look, I'm about to buy this company. It's a big transaction for me. I understand you're about to place a larger. Would, could you pause until I buy the company to place that order? And the guy said, I'd like to, Bob, but our cost savings is so dramatic, we get a payback of six months. And if I don't buy them and get them installed, I don't make my budget. Nobody needs six-month payback to buy equipment. So what is the no relation? The company thought. Because a cost was twenty-seven thousand, they were selling it for fifty-seven to sixty. They're making a fifty percent profit. They're doubling the cost. How much more money can you make? Within the next eighteen months, and they were selling thirty of these a year. Within the next eighteen months, we raised the price to one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars for that unit, and the cost went from twenty-seven thousand to seventeen because our volume went from thirty a year to one hundred and twenty a year. That was the driver of the public offering. That was the driver of our initial success. They were blinded by cost. I could give you 150 examples of that. We, we teach people to figure out what your cost is, think what margin you want to make, and come up with a sell price. The smartest guy I ever met didn't know what his cost was. So he just set his price at what the market was, and he made a ton of money. He didn't know what his cost was. He didn't have a cost accountant. Cost accounts contaminate your thinking. <laughs> I'm one, too. <laughs> so I'm telling you, we have applied that a million times. Unlock your mind to the potential for value and don't use costs. The market doesn't know what your cost is. It knows what it's willing to pay. We have done this multiple times. So I wanted to make sure. And believe me, because of the severity of the crisis back in 1983 to 1987, when we didn't know if we were going to live day to day, the lessons we learned there and we will never forget. To this day, those are still within me. It's, you know, some of us uh, who had parents who lived during the Great Depression, the people who lived in the Great Depression were shaped for the rest of their life by the severity of the Depression.
And, and, and I would say to you that I've been shaped by the severity of the challenges we face in the 80s. So uh, I, I think the other thing I want to mention to you that's very important to the uh, cultural side at the same time I was going through this business experience, I was raising a family of six kids, which is a challenge in itself. It's a leadership challenge in itself. I also was shaped by the Enron example. Enron had some wonderful cultural statements if you went to their website and their offices. But obviously, they were on the wall, but not in people's heads and hearts. And so I, there was a point in that time that this evolved for me. Business leaders were rated lower than lawyers or politicians, and that's really low. Okay, And so I felt embarrassed to be a businessman. Felt embarrassed to be running a business because of the image created by some of these companies. So we began what I use the word harmonize. We took our faith, our experiences, our education, and we blended them together and we began to see things for what they could be instead of what they were. Now we're going to talk about what shaped our cultures. Uh, and it, people ask me when this started. And this is going to sound stupid, but I bought a company in 1997 uh, uh, called Hasten. And for the three companies together, which Hasten was the largest, I paid about $45 million. And uh, it took us from, I think, uh, $100 million to $200 million between the three companies. So it was a very serious investment for me. So I flew down to South Carolina to their offices. And uh, I went in to get a cup of coffee. I'm an early morning person. I went to get a cup of coffee. And there were some employees standing around at the coffee machine. And it's during March Madness. And everybody's talking about what game they bet on, you know, whether they won some money, whether their team was in the final. And you know, I, I'm not a sports nut. I mean, I was aware of what they were doing. And I really wasn't paying attention. It was when I was just watching their body language. And the closer it got to 8 o'clock, you should, could just see the enthusiasm go out of their body. They had fun talking about something meaningless, winning $5, $10 on basketball. And when they went to, to do their profession, their energy had been taken out of them. Now, I didn't engage in a conversation with them. I was just having my, I didn't know anybody. I was the new owner, but I didn't know anybody. And I had to walk about 100 yards to a conference room. I didn't think about any of this. I just walked. I went from having a cup of coffee to a meeting room where I was going to meet with the customer service team. When, when I tell you about this, if you ask me why, I don't understand what happened. I walked from the coffee to the conference room, sat down with a group of people I'd never met in charge of our customer service. And I sat down and said, hi, I'm Bob. I have the opportunity to buy this company. Uh, we're going to play a game. I have no idea where that thought came from. Hadn't given it an ounce of thought. And they said, what? I said, because this group sells spare parts for machinery. I said, whoever sells the most parts each w week wins. And if the team makes the team goal, the team wins. We're going to do it every week. And they said, well, that won't work. Because you know, I handle the snack food, and I handle fresh produce, and I handle the general merchandise. I said, no, from now on, everybody just answers the phone. What I don't understand is for every question they had, I had an answer. And I didn't even think about it until I saw it down and said it. I do not understand where that came from. But it is the beginning of the culture that we had. Why? Because we listened to our people. Revenue went up dramatically. Profitability went up dramatically. The culture enhanced dramatically. We saw profound changes in behavior and customer service from a, an, or just a a customer service department that was not motivated. And it was amazing, the transformation. So games and motivation were a new, new thing for us at that time. And there were several other examples. The other thing that happened is I was at church on Y down here at the St. Michael's and St. George Church. Uh, Ed Salmon was the rector, and uh, Ed got up to give a sermon. You know, he, and uh, he was incredibly gifted. He was my mentor, and he got up and gave the sermon. And I thought, what an honor to be able to stand up in front of a group of people and to be so inspiring as to shape their lives. And as I got up to walk out of the church, I said, wait a second. Ed's only got me for 20 minutes a week. I've got these people under the influence of my leadership for 40 hours a week. 
if Ed thinks he can have an impact on my life, what if I were to embrace leadership principles that would shape the lives of the people who come to my church for 40 hours a week, every week, for the rest of their life, hopefully? And so we began to understand the profound impact leadership could have on the lives of the people that join us. Then I want to blend together another, and you guys, uh, Katie, you, you gave me the perfect segue. When you two get married, the person that walks you down the aisle is going to be uh, extremely proud. Is your father still alive? So if your father walks you down the aisle, everybody's going to be ooing and owing at how beautiful you look that day. And uh, as you get down to the altar, and your, your name's Mickey, Mickey. Uh, Mickey will be standing up there very proud, and everybody will be watching you. So as, as, as your father gets up to the altar, and he takes your hand, and he gives it to Mickey. And he says, you know, her mother, Katie's mother and I give her to be married to you, Mickey. Uh, it's very beautiful ceremonially, but that's not really what your dad's saying to Mickey. <laughs> Those are the words he is using, because that's the ceremony. But what he's really saying is... You know, Mickey, Katie's mom and I have spent at least 20 years trying to bring up this precious young lady to be everything she was meant to be. And I'm trusting you, Mickey, that as she joins together with you in this life together, that you will continue to shepherd Katie being everything she can be in her marriage with you. And if you think he's not thinking that when you're standing there, uh, you're wrong because that's the hope of every father as he sees his daughter. And it occurred to me that day at the wedding, my thought immediately, like it did in church, went to all the Katies that work for us around the world and all the Mickeys that work for us around. All who were brought into this world as special human beings whose parents simply wanted them to have a chance to develop and share their gifts and be appreciated and having a life of meaning and purpose. That's all your parents want when they bring you into this world. And unfortunately, some of you elect to go into businesses. So those combination of experiences woke me to the profound responsibility of leadership and the preciousness of every person that is a part of our organization. There's a Katie and a Mickey in every position in our company whose parents wanted something for them. And we are stewards. And so it occurred to me that every time we hire, and I think I want you to demand this when you get your first job offer, for whoever offers you the job, I want them to come out to the front of the building with the people who offer you the job, and I want you to bring your family with you. And I want them to say to you, if you will let Mickey or Kyle or Alex join our organization, we promise to be everything to them that we can possibly be to allow them to continue to uh, uh, develop their gifts at, for us to show them that their life is going to matter as they join the journey with us. That is what you, that is the oath we should take to every person that joins our organization as stewards of those precious lives. That's where we got it. From these experiences, we started to realize something special was happening here. So like an out-of-body experience. We're seeing profound changes in behavior, profound changes in, in, in responsibilities, profound changes in performance, everything from these initiatives I've touched on. And we sat down, we gathered a group of 20 people together, and we sat down and said, there's something bigger going on here that we need to understand. And we started writing things down. And we ended up writing down what we call the guiding principles of leadership. It's a little bit like my faith, the Ten Commandments. These are fundamentals of leadership that we should never forget. And everything we do should be in harmony with these principles. Uh, in my faith, it's the Ten Commandments. Treat others as you'd like to be treated. Is ours, it's the guiding principles of leadership. We measure success by the way we touch the lives of people. That statement was born of the Enron era. I was so tired of the way we define success as titles, monetary, CEO of a company, on the board of this, graduated from there, lives there. We define success in all the wrong ways. 
And we decided to, that success in our corporation was going to be measured by the way we touch the lives of people. Our suppliers, our team members, our shareholders, our bankers, that all of those people are precious people, just like Mickey and Kate, who deserve to be treated with respect and dignity in our journey. And if we did that, the world we live in would be an entirely different place than we did today. So we created those guiding principles of leadership. And guess what happened? We started to live them. We, we were afraid that we'd put them on the walls like Enron did, and they would never get in our heart. So we began having dialogues with people. We sat down with groups of union, non-union, office, plant, men, women, all age groups, and just talked about what we believed in. Every time we acquired a company, we shared these principles, and we sat down and we talked about what we believed in. We, we visited, uh, I was asked to speak to a, a $20 billion company a few years ago, and I gave a talk similar to this, uh, and they had 75 leaders from around the world uh, that they wanted to hear my talk. Uh, at the end of my talk, and they were videotaping it like Eli is here, and as, as, as I walked out after the talk, um, there were two women uh, standing by the cameraman, and they were crying standing right next to our sales associate who was going to take me to the airport. And I said hi to the, the, the ladies, and I walked down the aisle, uh, down the corridor, with the sales executive, and, I, and she said, did you notice those two women crying? I said, yes. Was it that bad? <laughs> and she said, no. She said, during your presentation, they leaned over to me and said, do you work for Barry Wimler? And she said, yes, I do. And, she, and uh, they said, is it really like that there? And she said, yes, it is. And they began crying. And what they, they said this statement that a lot of people feel, but very few people say, I wish I worked for a company like that. So how do we live these principles that we talked about? Well, we got to test them in the 2008-2009 economic downturn. We're in capital goods. Our new equipment orders dropped 35% in the economic downturn. It was like uh, nobody, everybody stopped doing everything. And I happened to be, in, in, and when I walked into our board meeting in February, so the economic downturn happened in the fall of 2008, uh, and uh, the end of January, I, I touched base with all of our executives, because we have long lead time equipment. So I talked to all of our executives and said, I'm going into a board meeting, give me your sense. And they said, we think we're going to be okay. I walk into our board meeting, and uh, the first thing our directors say, do you need to lay off somebody? I said, I don't think so. I think we're going to be OK. Bob, are you sure you're not being optimistic? No, I just checked with our team. I think we're going to be OK. So I then had the board meeting and went to Italy. And while I was in Italy, one of the major consumer products companies canceled a major order. And it seemed like it all just hit us in that early February, late February time frame. And I happened to be in Italy, and I thought, what am I going to do? Because for 40 years, well, at that stage, for 35 years, whenever we had an economic downturn, we did what everybody does. We let people go, right? You right-size your, it's a nice way to describe it, we right-sized our organization. So I sat in my room in Italy, and I thought, what am I going to do? We've been, we believe in this culture. We've been talking about it now. I believe in it. And I thought, if we, if we do what we've always done, it'll destroy the initiatives we have in our culture. So I thought, again, these thoughts come to me. I don't know where they came from. I thought, what would a caring family do if the family was stressed and everybody would pitch in? So I came up with the idea of, of furloughs. What if everybody in the company took the time off so nobody would have to be let go? And I, I, I add a couple of other things. Even, and, and, and suspended 401k matches which is about a million and a half dollars a quarter, so six million a year. So I, I put together some thoughts, and I emailed it to our team, and I said, we've got to do something. Here's my suggestion. What do you think? And within a matter of 10 days, we implemented, implemented almost $20 million of initiatives where nobody got let go. Uh, we protected the health of everybody. It was amazing, the reaction of people, because they were ready, you know, clearly... They were walking on eggs thinking it was their job or their friend's job. Because you know, one of the things you can't do in, 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 a, in a reduction of size 
you can't anticipate the impact on the collateral damage. My son worked at KPMG at that time, consulting, and they had a massive reduction in consulting. He made the cut. He didn't get cut. But the three guys sitting next to him, who he knew their kids, their wife, and their families did, and he was demoralized. So he stayed, but he saw these three families lose their living. And I said to our team, how many of you have ever been let go? What does it feel like to walk in your home and tell your family, I was told to clean out my desk by 5 o'clock. I don't know how we're going to make the mortgage payment. I don't know how we're going to make our, house, you know, our car payments. I don't know what we're going to do because there are no jobs. So as a result of that, we got through the economic downturn, and we protected the health of everybody. In 2010, we had the best year in our history. Was it because of what we did? I think that contributed materially because the morale was amazing in our company because everybody didn't worry about losing their job when everybody was losing their jobs. Everybody was being impacted. So I always say who you are is shown in tough times, not good times. Good times never shows anybody's character. Tough times do. And when we got through that period of time, it was amazing the impact it made on our team members. Merits did a survey that only 10% of the people that work for American organizations believe they work for a company that cares about them. 90% of the people go home feeling that they don't matter. And they go home to their families feeling empty. You might get excited with your first job out of graduate business school, right? But you're going to have this feeling. There's about a 90% chance you are going to feel this way, too, at some stage. What we've found in this journey, another milestone, defining moment, is everybody, everybody, the receptionists, the, accounting, the cost accountants, the sales, everybody wants to know that their life matters. In this journey, uh, somebody made the following statement, which I believe epitomizes my experience of 40 years. We've been paying people for their hands for years, and they would have given us their head and their heart for free if we'd only know how to ask them. Because when you engage people's heads and hearts, this triangle, their hands, their heads, and their heart, you see the unbelievable potential of people. That is what we have seen in our company. That is what uh, Marcus has seen and Chris has seen and others have visited our company. We are engaging people's heads and hearts. We're showing them that we genuinely care about them and it makes a profound impact on people. Uh, at, at Barry Wimmel University, which Sarah is uh, uh, overseeing, uh, we teach people. We can't send them to any institution in the country to learn our leadership model because you're taught management. Okay, We teach leadership. We teach people how to ask people for their heads and hearts. And we teach people how to say thank you for people sharing it. Um, so we, what, how do we live this? We work every day to align everything we do to our guiding principle of leadership. We work very hard on communication, to communicate our values, both by our actions and our words. We are a privately held company, but the information is public. We tell people how we're doing. We tell people what our strategy is. We share, because by sharing, we validate their worth. We invest in teaching. We're spending several million dollars a year teaching people-centric leadership, leadership that is based upon the preciousness of Katie and Mickey and their sense of wanting to do something with their life that has meaning and purpose. I hope you're not just trying to get a job. I hope that what this school has given you is a sense of purpose, a sense that you want that this is a chance to develop and share your gifts and be appreciated for it and impact the lives of others. So we're constantly, uh, one of the things that we do, which is unique in Barry Waymiller, we are constantly looking for the goodness in people. Constantly looking in our communication and in our celebration events. We're constantly having celebrations for the goodness of people. We're trying to always hold up good behavior and not focus on broken behavior. Our focus is on encouraging people by focusing on the goodness. We have a unique program. When we developed these guiding principles of leadership, I went up to our northern Wisconsin plant that's got about 500 people, and somebody said, you know, Bob, you come up and you talk about these guiding principles of leadership, and we all feel good. But then you leave, and, and our normal behavior kind of drifts back in, 
Isn't there something we could do to keep it alive between this dialogue? And I, you know, I'm a car nut, and I happen to have these uh, at the time, these kind of crazy Chevy retro SSRs. So I said, again, like that game, I said, what if we send this uh, car up and you all nominate somebody who embodies our leadership principles and then we'll surprise, every week we'll surprise somebody during the summer months and give them this car to drive for a week. It was that simple a thought, like the games. Five years later, it is one of the most profound things we do. We now have a fleet of 17 of these cars that go around the country and they are awarded to people based on their goodness. Marcus has been to our Akron plant, one of our finest cultures anywhere. And I was talking to one of the gentlemen, a machinist who won the SSR. And I said, how did it feel to be recognized? You know, the gentleman was probably 60 years old. I said, how does it feel to be recognized by your peers for your leadership abilities? And this gentleman said to me, it's nice to know after 32 years that I've made a difference. That's pitiful. If that was your father, and he worked in a place of the qualities of this gentleman, and it was after 32 years that people paused to let them know that he made a difference. And Richard Pike. Richard Pike is a, is a machinist in our South Carolina plant. And he said to me, I said, Richard, how did it feel to win? He said, well, first of all, Bob, I didn't think I deserved it. He said, you know, I, when I was nominated, I was overwhelmed. And when I was selected as the first winner in this plant of 250 people, I was amazed. I said, well, that was a year ago. How does it feel today, Richard? He said, every day I come into work, I try to be the person people think I am now. I said, Richard, if God had known that SSRs were going to have that impact on the world, he would have sent cars instead of disciples to the world to shape lives. Because clearly that's what anybody wants of somebody, to be everything they were meant to be. Probably have had 250 to 300 winners over the last five or six years. And I've talked to many of them in groups. Some of the most emotional conversations I've ever had. But I'm going to generalize what people say. This is recognition and celebration. I don't think you're taught recognition and celebration at Washington University. We are taught recognition and celebration at Barry Whitman University by our Washington U grad. Okay? And so there's some goodness here. We just tapped into it right up there. Uh, but what people say is, when I, got, I can't believe I got nominated, I can't believe I won, and the first thing they do is call their spouse. And if you listen to it as many times as I did, you listen to what they're really saying. They say, I called my spouse and said, you can't believe I won. But what they really are saying to the spouse is, you know, honey, you are really lucky to be married to me. <laughs> Because clearly, I was just picked out of 450 people as an outstanding leader. The second thing they say to me, ladies, is that they took their mother for a ride. Now, it's a pretty simple statement. They took their mother for a ride, right? That's not what they're really saying. Those are the words they use. What they're saying is, I took the person, uh, uh, the most meaningful person in my life, I took that car over to show them the car because I want my mother to know I turned out okay. It's amazing. In all of these conversations, nine out of ten people, nine out of ten people say they took their mother for a ride, not their father. Why? Because our mothers are our source of goodness. And we want our mother, the guys and the girls, say they take their mother for a ride. Now, a lady who was in our IT department in Baltimore, after I gave a, an award one day, a lady came up to me after I just said what I said to you, and she said, Bob, I won a couple of weeks ago, and I took my daughter up into the mountains in Baltimore area, and we had a wonderful time for a week. I said, great. And she said, but I, I do have to tell you uh, that my mother passed away, so I didn't get a chance to take my mother for a ride, but I will tell you that I took the car to the cemetery uh, to my mom's tombstone to show my mother I turned out okay. What you're seeing is this profound need for every one of you and our team members to feel that their life matters. And when it feels like it matters, who do you want to tell? You want to tell your mother. You want your mother, 
who put up with you to do that. So we have learned a tremendous amount. We've tapped into an incredible energy by our recognition and celebration. And I am sure eventually the Olin Business School at the graduate level will teach recognition and celebration. It is one of our most powerful classes. And it doesn't matter at what level, everybody wants to know their life matters. One more story. Uh, I was in uh, Green Bay. And this, this is the biggest learning I had right here. I was in Green Bay, and we're on the lean journey, which uh, Brian is uh, uh, talking about, which Jim Womack at Harvard started based on Toyota production system. And we were implementing this, and we're having an initial kickoff in Green Bay. And I got an email the night before our executive meeting in Green Bay uh, from our operations executive. He said, Bob, you might want to go out in the plant. There's a group of people that did a volunteer lean event, and they've had some really great results. And I said, well, Craig, why don't you just invite them in to talk to all of our presidents in the morning rather than uh, 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 just uh, having me go out there. So they came in. These, there was two UAW workers, one non-union team member, and a leader. They stood before about 20 of our people, and they, they went through all the typical. Reduced uh, lead time, uh, improved cost, better quality, on-time delivery, all the metrics of lean. Again, I don't know where it came from, but I said to this gentleman uh, with the beard there in the middle, Steve, I said, Steve, because I really was paying no attention to the metrics. <laughs> and I said, Steve. How did it affect your life? And like I told you, uh, on, the, on, the, on understand there's no relationship between cost and market, on the soft side, this is the most important lesson I can tell you. What Steve said to me was amazing. Because Steve, I never met him before. He didn't know he was coming in that day, so he did not have a prepared comment. I said to Steve, how is it affecting your life, lean? He said he's talking to his wife more. I said, I don't understand. He said, you know what it's like to work for a company where you go in, you punch a time card, or you go sit at your desk. You're not given the things you need to do your job. You get 10 things right, and nobody says a word. You get one thing wrong, and, and you never hear the end of it. You got questions, and it takes you a week to get an answer. Then they complain about your salary, or how much you cost, or your benefits. Do you know what it feels like to walk home at night, to go home to your family? He said, you feel pretty empty. And he said, when I'm not feeling very good about myself, I'm not the nicest guy in the world. But he said, since you began this empowerment program where I actually contributed to making things better, I actually had a chance to impact things, I feel pretty good about myself. And I find, when I feel good about myself, I'm nicer to my wife. You know what's amazing? I found when I'm nicer to my wife, she talks to me. I stood there and I said, the measurement of lean, the single most important measurement of lean, should be the reduction in the divorce rate. That's the only metric that's going to count. Because, why? Because Steve felt valued. He got to contribute to what he was doing. He got to be a part of it. His gifts came out, OK? So now I got the last piece of that story because this, this is the most powerful thing on the soft side of our business culturally. I was walking with my daughter who's about 40 who's got three kids and a lady who had a TV show in Dallas on family counseling in the mountains uh, in Colorado. And my daughter knew that this lady had a TV program so she's, and her kids are you know, from 15 to uh, 7. And she said, Beverly, what's the single most important thing in raising good kids. So this is a lesson, Mickey and Katie, you can write this down. <laughs> um, and Beverly said, a good marriage. OK? And I said, bingo. I just got the DNA chain of leadership. If we treat people with dignity and respect through our leadership models to show that they matter, and they go home feeling good about themselves, they're going to treat their family better because they feel valued themselves. If they treat their spouse better, their children are going to see a loving marriage. And if they see a loving marriage, they have a better chance of having one themselves. 
if we are sending 90% of the people home each night feeling not valued, and we see the issues we face at a country today, we in business are creating that issue. Because we see people as objects to our success, not as precious human beings like Katie is going to be walking down that aisle. So that simple statement by Steve, who said as a result of our leadership model, he has a better marriage, was profound to us. I don't ever want you to have a dinner like I had because of this class, you should never have to have it. But I met with a, a gentleman that was ex has been extremely successful uh, in private equity. And he heard one of my speeches and he f flew out to have dinner with me and talk. And I said, what are you, what's important and what do you feel good about in your life? The guy's worth million, hundreds of millions of dollars. He said, well, I have a minority a athletic scholarship program that I feel really good about. I'm known for my big gift to the universities, but what I feel good about is minority athletic program. And I said, how many of those people do you uh, support each year through that program? He said, probably six or eight. I said, how many employees do you think you have? 100,000, he said, probably. So I said, what you're telling me is you feel good about helping six or eight people outside the company. And the 100,000 people who work for you every day, whose life and joy depends upon the way they're treated, they're just objects to your wealth. He said, could you come up and talk to our people? He said, after about a three-hour dinner, I get it. I thought I worked so I could do good. Make enough money so I can give my church. I can make enough money so I can give to the things I care about. But making money is tough, and that's different. He said, you do good at work. The greatest charity, the greatest thing you will ever give back to the society of which you've come from is being a great leader, of treating the people that are under your care with profound respect and dignity and not as objects for your wealth. And... Um, as Bill Urey, uh, who just visited, uh, and uh, Mark has got a chance to meet, and uh, uh, who is a global peace negotiator, he said, we need to move from a me society to a we society. Because this isn't all about the job you get and the money you're going to make. It's the impact you're going to make on the world and a chance to use your gifts to truly make a profound impact. And my hope is that by some of the lessons we've shared, you'll think about the profound responsibility of leadership. So in summary, you have an amazing opportunity when you leave this school to change the world by the way in which you see the people that are, join you in that journey that you have a chance to influence. From your family, Kate and Mick, to the organizations, they're all precious human beings that deserve to be treated with respect and dignity. You need to design a business model that's got good fundamentals that is going to survive the test of time. That's what we did. We've had it since 1988. It's created phenomenal value, and it continues to do that. There is no relationship between something's value and its cost. And recognition and celebration are a critical aspect of leadership that we have learned that celebrates the goodness of every life, and it is unbelievably meaningful to the people in the slightest of gestures. And you have an opportunity in leadership to do that. So leadership, we call it people, purpose, and performance. Uh, there's a restaurant in the town I live where it's quality, price, and service. Pick any two. You can't pick any two in people, purpose, and performance. It's all three. It starts with people. It doesn't start with numbers. It starts with the impact you make on the people who join together with you in a common economic endeavor with a vision that is compelling. You've got to have a purpose. You've got to be able to share that purpose, other than just you want to get rich. Okay? And then you've got to perform. As I told you, if you don't perform, you can't support your family, you can't support the people whose families you support. So it's people, starts with people. You've got to have a purpose that is compelling that you can share. 
and you got to perform. And I will tell you that as you embark upon your leadership journey, there's nothing, nothing that can compare to the opportunity of leadership and the way you can shape people's lives by your leadership model. And don't judge your success by the common metrics. Judge your success by the way you impact the people's lives in your journey. I was asked, how can we put the soul into leadership? First of all, we need to teach people how to connect their soul to the principles to live those in harmony. If you don't know how to do that, you're going to go out and you're going to be managers. And you're going to continue the problem we have in this country of sending people home empty, abused, and objects of your gratification. The current issue of Harvard uh, uh, is the value of happiness. I want you to look at the uh, illustration on the front of the cover. Do you notice the dollar signs on the end of the smile? That's the smile of greed. <laughs> OK? Those aren't hearts at the end of the smile. It's not deeply seen the goodness in people. It is about money. That's unfortunate that they characterize happiness with the dollar signs. Um, and they talk about how employee well-being uh, drives profits. Why would a leading institution in this country, when talking about happiness, drive profits? Is that the only justification? Is that in your mind the only reason we do this? I'm going to use one last example. We, some years ago, had a, a problem brought from our uh, finance department to our personnel department. That, um, that we had a problem with my workman's compensation insurance costs because accidents had gone up. So our finance department went to the uh, personnel department and said, you got to do something or, or we're going to blow our budget. And they decided to take a pause in this culture we have now and reflect. And they decided that this was not about workman's case, the compensation costs. In a reflective uh, moment, they decided it was about not wanting our friends to get hurt. Today, our workman's compensation costs is half the industry. Why? Not because we want to reduce workman's compensation insurance, but because we didn't want our friends to get hurt. The overwhelming response to not wanting their friends to get hurt compared to reducing workman's compensation costs is profound. So you've got to inspire. You have, you're going to have, because of your degree, an opportunity to impact lives. And I want, by the, and, and my colleagues here assured me that they're going to make sure that when you reach that graduation moment, that you are anxious to have a chance to live your values in harmony with your leadership skills and to impact people's lives. And if, if you're worried about not being able to do it, uh, I was at that company, at that $20 billion company, the last question I had is, well, Bob, it all sounds good, but what if our corporate doesn't support it? What if corporate doesn't support these concepts? And what struck me was the Wizard of Oz. Because everybody went to the wizard to look for a heart, a mind, courage. And when the wizard's facade was discovered, and he was just an older man with, with uh, some bells and whistles, he said to each of them, you've got the courage, you've got the mind, you've got the heart, you've had it all along to do what you want to do. To this group, I said, what do you need from corporate? A memo? As of Monday, we're going to be good to people? Do you need a requisition? Is there some amount of money you need to be good to people? What do you need to say, you 75 people, that together we can make a profound impact on the 100,000 people that work for this organization? So you don't need the corporations you go to, because you're going to find that they're probably in that 90% category sending people home fulfilled. But you have an opportunity with your life and the life you intend to leave uh, to make sure that if Katie works in your organization, she, that precious young lady gets a chance to be everything her parents wanted her to be in this world. That is the responsibility of leadership. It is the stewardship of the lives that come under your opportunity to influence them. And from the professors to you as students, that's the only way we're going to have the kind of world that you and I want to bring children into and raise my grandchildren and to be a part of. And we are the problem. We are the problem. And we are the solution if we embrace people-centric leadership that values the individual and the impact we make on their lives. Thank you.